Okay, so let's go ahead and get started. Hopefully you had a good Easter break. I don't know about you, but I'm so ready for the semester to be over with. <laughs> it's just, a. Uh, it seems like it's never going to end. Um, but this is the last of chapter 21, which is on lipid um, anabolism. And now we're going to start with looking at the steroids, the cholesterol in particular. You do not need to memorize all the steps of the cholesterol. In fact, that we don't even go over all the steps because it's very, very in-depth, um, detailed process. Okay, so it starts with acetyl-CoA and it works its way up to squalene. And squalene is considered to be the precursor of cholesterol and steroids. And, um, and I think, I want to say that squalene is named after sharks. I don't remember now. I may completely be making that up. If so, I'm going to own it. Um, Because I know know that that it was first... It was first uh, isolated in larger quantities from sharks. But it is the precursor of cholesterol and steroids. And you start from two groups. um, You know, the two-carbon acetyl group of acetyl-CoA. Okay? And so, in the beginning, you're going to have two acetyl-CoA coming together in order to condensation reaction, and I want you to know the steps from acetyl-CoA to mevalonic acid, or mevalonate, I should say, and that's because it's important in medicine. It's where they usually try to target for cholesterol homeostasis, and you hear about the statin drugs and things like that. So I do expect you to know just those first steps, and then understand that there, there are steps that go from mevalonate to squalene, and from squalene to cholesterol, I mean, there's, I want to say like 30 some odd steps. I mean, you do not need to, it's, it's a very complicated process to make, and this is endogenous cholesterol. Okay, so in the beginning, we're faith integration, we start with two acetyl CoAs, where they do this condensation, and it kicks off a coenzyme A, a coash, and we've actually seen this enzyme before, so we've encountered it twice already. What enzyme is it that takes two acetyl CoAs and puts them together to make acetyl acetyl CoA? Thiolase. Okay. So that's why we've seen it in the breakdown and in the buildup of the, um, breakdowns of the acids and buildups and also now we're talking about cholesterol. Okay. And so now we take acetyl acetyl CoA from that first step and we are going to add another acetyl group using acetyl CoA. So what class of enzymes can start adding things like this to make another compound. Synthase. Like a synthase, right? And it wouldn't be a synthetase because it is missing ATP or GTP. Okay, so if you're going to name this one, what would you name it? HMG. What? HMG-CoA synthase. This is HMG-CoA synthase. So, and HMG, just in, you may have heard of HMG, it's an abbreviation whenever they talk about some of the cholesterol drugs and things like that, and that stands for Technically, it's beta, but it's hydroxymethylglutaryl, and the CoA is just the fact that it's got the coenzyme A attached to it. <clears throat> and then we have mevalonate that gets formed at the expense of two NADPHs, and it kicks off the coenzyme A. Okay. So what class or classes of enzymes can do this kind of reaction? Because if you notice, the big difference between this is the fact that You don't have a coenzyme A, and you've transformed an acetyl group into a, let's see, 1, 2, 3, 4, let me make sure I count this correctly, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, yep. You turned the acetyl group into an alcohol, so what class or classes of enzymes could this be? What type of reaction is this? A reduction, okay, and so what class or classes of enzyme could this be? Like a reductase, right? What else could some of the, like, what are some of the other possibilities, instead of just saying reductases, sometimes they're also called dehydrogenases, and so I would have accepted, but this is HMG-CoA reductase, but I would have accepted the fact that if you called it a, because technically it is a type of dehydrogenase, <clears throat> but this one's HMG-CoA reductase, and it's important Later on, I don't want you to forget the HMG CoA reductase because that's a major um, enzyme that gets targeted medically. All right, and that's how we get to mevalonate. Then, from mevalonate, if you can see from here, just to get to the squalene, 
there's many, many steps. Some of these you could figure out based off of the types of enzyme names, you know, types of enzyme reactions that's occurring. But once again, I don't expect you to, to memorize these. Please don't. But you can just see it's a very complicated process. I do want to point out a couple things, though, in the sense that we have, oops, where is it? The geronal group, geronal, geronal, and the farnesyl group, and things like that that we talked about last semester. Those are the isoprenoids. Geronal means it's 10 carbons. Farnesyl means it's 15 carbons of the isoprene units. So that's one of the reasons why you'll talk, you hear about some of the farnesyl transferase inhibitors and how they try to use them as for lipid control, but they haven't been the, the best. FTI has not been the best so far to date, but they were hoping that it would be another way to look at controlling uh, endogenous cholesterol synthesis. Then, from squalene to cholesterol, there's 25 or more steps, like I said. Like to so total from acetyl-CoA to cholesterol, we're talking well over 30 steps. And you do not need to, to know these. But the squalene itself, you can start to see how it has that multi-ring, how it, well, it's not a ring, but how it's starting to look like it could form the multi-rings that we know from cholesterol. I don't expect you to memorize cholesterol shape, but you should know the tetracyclic generic shape of the sterols, which is where you have three of the cyclohexyl hex groups and then one cyclopentyl group. Squalene doesn't look like it's very stable. Well, I mean, you know, it's, it's, it's fair, fairly stable. It's hydrophobic, very, very hydrophobic. It's just that they've got that positioned like that to where you can see the how the rings are going to form. Oh, okay. So they've got it. But in reality, okay. it's going to be able to move. There's flexibility. Okay. They just made it look like that. <clears throat> mm-hmm. To where you could see, oh, this is going to easily become a cyclohexyl group, cyclohexyl group, cyclohexyl, and cyclopentyl group. Okay. <clears throat> okay. So now the cholesterol itself, to review from... A and P is the starting material for a, a large number of different types of biological compounds, um, including bile, the bile acids, your sex hormones, the mineral corticoid, mineral corticoids, and glucocorticoids. Okay. Right. Oh. And these are just some examples of the steroid hormones. Once again, I don't expect you to memorize their structures, other than the fact that of recognizing if I had given you the structure that you would say, oh, that's a sterol or steroid hormone of some sort. But one thing I always like to point out is the fact that the difference between testosterone and estradiol, there's very, very little difference between the male and female hormones. It's really that um, first, the, I think they put the, the, the A ring, <clears throat> All right. Now, I do want you to know this because this is very important. Because whenever people talk about, oh, my cholesterol is bad, you know, or, you know, my, you know, my grandfather has problems with cholesterol, technically they're not talking about cholesterol itself. Because cholesterol is not just free floating in your body as cholesterol, okay? And so they make these cholesterol esters, sometimes abbreviated CE. Okay, and so I want you to know the class of enzymes that, that does this. And so what's the, I mean, yes, this is an ester, but what's the big difference between cholesterol and the cholesterol ester? What's this functional group also called? It's an acyl group, okay? So we have acylated it. So what class or classes of enzymes could this be? Acyl like an acyl transferase, okay. And so this is abbreviated ACAT, which stands for acyl-CoA cholesterol acyl transferase. It tells you specifically what it is. It also lets you know that it doesn't have to be, many times it is an acetyl group that gets transferred, but it doesn't have to be an acetyl group. It can be a larger acyl group, okay. So it's a little bit more promiscuous than that. So that's ACAT, acyl-CoA cholesterol acyl transferase. <clears throat> what do you suppose the purpose of the CEs, the cholesterol esters, are? Like, why would you make it a cholesterol ester? 
Yep, you can use it for storage, for transport. Okay, they're going to be going into the larger um, lipoprotein complexes. Okay, and they are much more hydrophobic, which, why is that important? I mean, cholesterol itself is already pretty hydrophobic, but you're getting rid of an alcohol group and turning it into an ester. It's becoming even more hydrophobic. And the longer that acyl group is, even more hydrophobic it becomes. But why is that important? Like, where is it kept at, the cholesterol esters? It can be in the membrane, but what about for the transport? Like, where do you store it and transport it? Like the chylomicrons, and you also hear them talk. So a lot of times when people talk about their cholesterols, they're really doing a lipid panel. And so they're talking about some cholesterol esters, but especially like the LDL, HDL, those can contain cholesterol esters, but there's actually much more to it. And so that's why the good cholesterol versus bad cholesterol technically has more than just cholesterol in it. Okay, and so lipids are transported by the lipoproteins. And these are not individual proteins. They make a large, you know, uh, complex, for lack of a better word, like a vesicle, if you want to think of it that way. And I do want you to know the relative order where the smallest, and when I say smallest, I mean the lowest density ones are the chylomicrons, and it goes from very low density all the way up to in theory, to very high-density lipoproteins. And you, there's also another class here called IDL, which is intermediate, which is in between LDL and HDL. The, the two that they usually test for and talk about the most are your LDLs and your HDLs. And the LD and HD part, that's talking about the density. <clears throat> okay. Now, the density is primarily, primarily due to the, the protein content, how much protein is each in is in each of those um, vesicles or those transport vesicles. So the more protein you have, the higher the density it is. The more lipid-based it is, the lower the density, which makes sense. You know, the fat floats on top of water. Okay. So which of those is considered your good cholesterol, of the four that's shown right there, at least? The HDL. And so LDL would be your bad cholesterol. <coughs> And what's really important, actually, is your ratio of good to bad. So I can speak about my personal experience, and it runs in my family, um, is that I actually have really, really good numbers for my HDL. It's just the fact that my LDLs are... And, I mean, I've got really good numbers for my LDLs, but it's just the fact that my HDL numbers are too low. And so because of that, it makes my ratio of HDL to LDL be too low. Because you want an ideal ratio. <clears throat> so that's why I, I don't take a statin drug for it. That's why I can't have sugar. Because <clears throat> as you hopefully have figured out, you limit your sugars and your carbohydrates because even though sugar is not a lipid, we have these ways of breaking the sugars down and then going to build them up to make the fats for storage. Okay. All right, so as I was mentioning before, I'm going to actually focus here on HDL and LDL first. HDL, I called it happy, because that way you can remember that it's the good one, and it transports the cholesterol to the liver from the body tissues, usually, in general, whereas the LDL transfers the cholesterols and the lipids from the liver to other places. VLDLs are the transport of endogenous lipids, the ones that you're making yourself. Whereas chylomicrons are usually indicative of the exogenous, those lipids that are from your diet. Okay. So that's why you don't want to have too many chylomicrons either. Because usually that means you have a really high fatty diet. So these LDLs is bad because it's bringing out, bringing cholesterol. Well, I mean, it's bad because it's bringing in cholesterol to other places as well. But it's also bad because of the fact that it. It just has a much higher lipid content. And so if you have a high LDL, one of the reasons why you can have a high LDL is because of the fact that you just have too much lipids, too much fat. Okay. Too little protein. Okay, I don't think this... Well, yeah, it kind of, it kind of comes, comes up. And so it's really cool if you ever... 
look at the blood plasma, you can tell like when people have eaten or not because if you've been fasting and of course they spin out the cells and just look at the, the plasma itself, it's relatively translucent. You know, you can see through it. It's at whatever that color is. But if right after you eat a meal, especially the more higher the lipid content is of your meal, it does make it get fatty. Okay, so you'll be able to see the chylomicrons and it makes it milky looking. <clears throat> so it's really gross. And if any of you, have any of you guys gone to an, one, viewed one of the autopsies of someone who's really obese? It's disgusting. You just want to go on a diet. So, like this one woman's autopsy that I went to, when they did the Y incision, like it took both hands of the medical examiner to like peel back the fat. I mean, it just looked like insulation. It just reminded me of like ceiling insulation. It's just nasty. And her body fluids were just full of chylomicrons and, you know, fat materials. It did. It was really nasty. Okay. <clears throat> this, I think I actually showed this figure last semester as well. Maybe I didn't. But, um, I want you to, to be able to explain the rationale behind this. Uh, first of all, this is just an example from your book of what, you know, of what the LDLs would, would look like or look like in a sense. That's why I said that it's not an individual cholesterol or even a little group of cholesterol esters. It's much more complicated than that. It does have like a membrane layer, and then it's got the fat vesicles stored on the inside. Okay, and then it's going to have its appropriate lipoproteins expressed on the outside for, for, so that way the receptors can recognize it and everything. Now, to me, it took me a while to understand the logic behind this because it almost seems counterintuitive. Okay, so the APO, APOB means apolipoprotein B, and it's what keeps the fatty acids soluble in the aqueous environment. Okay? And then once again, ACAT is what's going to add the, um, the, the acyl group to the cholesterol for storage later on to make it more hydrophobic. <clears throat> if you remember last year when we did, I showed you that video, I think, of the little kids, like the fifth or sixth graders that did the exocytosis and endocytosis little dance. It was such a, I forgot what music it was set to. But they were all color coordinated. Um, if not, you can just Google, and you can look it up on YouTube. But they did the Clapham coated pits, and this is related to that. Okay. So you've eaten. <coughs> now we're transporting the cholesterol esters. Oh, it has frozen. There we go. And so the LDL is going to come in with the apolipoprotein B, and it's going to bind to the LDL receptor, and that causes a conformational change that's going to recruit the clathrin, which are proteins that help make the, the you know, it's called invagination, but to make the, what's it called, like pucker, the membrane, so it can become invaginated to where it can pinch off. So it deliberately distorts the shape of the membrane to where it's easier for it to pinch off for the endocytosis. Okay. So this is showing how it's the cholesterol esters that are inside the, the LDL is bound, causes a conformational change, the clathrin gathers together, forces the invagination for the exocytosis, and then it goes on into you know, the cytosol. And the pH changes, there's a pH difference, and that also helps um, with the signaling for what to do with the fats. Okay, and so once it gets to the endosome, if you're healthy, then what's going to happen is the LDL receptors themselves will be exocytosed back, or I should say will be recruited back to the membrane to go for the next go-around, <clears throat> whereas the lysozyme will help hydrolyze the fats. Okay? The proteins of the, of the LDL will then be proteased and allow for the amino acids to be used either for energy or to be used to make proteins or neurotransmitters, whatever you want to do with the amino acids that we've talked about in the past. And the lysozyme will also help break apart the cholesterol and to release it for its use. Okay? Now, some of the things are that it can be used for is to... Come on now. It's frozen once again. <laughs> it's 
really posing this time. Well, so some of the things are, it can be used to make what this, there it is. It can be used to make the uh, sterile, sterile, not speak today, sterols and steroid hormones that cluster the building blocks for. Okay. Now, it's still not going to work. So then, there we go. So we can't just have free cluster all around. So for storage, ACAT will come in, acerify it or isolate it in order for it to be stored for long term storage or longer term storage. Okay. That's for your exogenous, your exogenous cholesterols. We, at the same time, we do have cholesterol synthesis that's occurring endogenously. Okay, so we have the HMG CoA reductase. It's ultimately going to help for the formation of squalene. Squalene goes 25 more steps or more to make the cholesterol. And once again, that cholesterol can be sterified by ACAT for, for storage. But let's say that you have way too much cholesterol, which in the Western diet is easy for it to happen. So then what happens is it starts to regulate things. Of course, ACAT's going to be upregulated in the sense that for storage. But then it's going to go back, and if you have an oversupply of it, there are two things that happen. One is it's, for, if you're, for normal healthy people, is it's going to want to shut down HMG-CoA reductase. So that way your body doesn't continue to make endogenous cholesterol because your body doesn't need it. It has plenty of it from the diet. But the part that was really um, difficult or seemed counterintuitive to me is the fact that the oversupply of the cholesterol, whenever it starts to build up, is it actually inhibits the formation of the LDL receptors. And so to me, that was just seemed like counterintuitive. You'd think, okay, you would want to make more LDL receptors so that way you can bring it in and get it out of your bloodstream and everything. However, it doesn't do that because what it's saying is this cell has too much cholesterol. So it's not, it doesn't need any more cholesterol, so it's going to downregulate the expression of the LDL receptors. So if you keep overindulging in your diet, you'll actually decrease the number of LDL receptors on the adipocytes. And so, therefore, that LDL has to go somewhere, okay? So, because it's going to be building up in your bloodstream, and that's where bad things can happen, okay? You can form plaques, you can form cysts, and it's not just in your bloodstream. And this is usually the point, which I, don't, I didn't have time to Google it ahead of time. I don't think it's on here. That one's not it. But um, <clears throat> if I can't find it in this class, I'll definitely show it on Wednesday. The surgery where they have to remove a cholesterol cyst. And so you can actually technically get these cholesterol ester cysts anywhere. Okay? Like, it doesn't have to be just in your bloodstream or in your, around your liver or anything like that. You can get them in other places in your body as well. That's the same as, like, body tumors, right? Right. Mm -hmm. I don't remember. I didn't check to see if this one still works, so let's see. It's a thinking. So what would happen if um, the body didn't do that? Like if it just kept increasing the cholesterol in the cell? I'm not sure. I mean, I guess in theory, the adipocyte would just get bigger, 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 bigger. Right? Because they, they already get large. Or is that just like what fatty tumor is? Like no, not necessarily, because... Well, that's really so. It's still waiting. Um, no, the fatty tumor, like a cyst, doesn't have to have be cellular. Like, the one that I'll show you is not a cell. It is membranous, but it's not a body, a body cell. It just gets, I mean, this one, it's in the sinus cavity, and it gets really huge. Sinus cavity. Yeah, and it's really snotty. Why is this? I have a signal. Let me see if I can. I don't have the sound plugged in anyway, so... Give me a chance to do way, that. Maybe <laughs> <laughs> After this, I always like it if it is, someone's been like eating uh, French fries or something, something really nice and greasy. <laughs> Let's see if I can find the video because 
I always have to be careful with the whatever pops up on YouTube. I think this may have been the video the one time that I wanted to show, and on the suggested videos alongside it, it was Oprah Winfrey's a racist. <laughs> and I'm like, I has nothing to do with a cholesterol cyst. <laughs> Well, I mean, you 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 can excrete it in your excrement, and so that's why some people that are like with the Alustra fat substitute, where I mean, essentially it's a lipid that your body just can't break down. And so it used to be really big in the late nineties to early two thousands, and they started making like potato chips and all these things with the Alustra with the fat substitute. So that way they were technically fat free or low fat, and it came up with a warning that said it may cause anal leakage. Because your body can't get rid of that lipid, and so it comes out. So, and some people are really sensitive to it. I'm looking to see. Ever since they changed you, YouTube, it makes it much more difficult to. I used to like the old one where you could just say favorite, and it would just save it, and it was. It was it done. Of course, now you're gonna if I this would see all my Walking Dead parody stuff. <laughs> Let's see. I had a customer ask me uh, the other day which dressings were the like, low fat ones. I was like, well, any of the non dairy ones? And she was like, well, which are those? <laughs> <laughs> I had to list all of them. <laughs> 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 like, any of the vinaigrettes? <laughs> I eventually, like, well, they have like a, they have, like, a book for like all that kind of stuff. So, like, if they have an allergy. She made me go through the entire book and tell her which one was like the lowest fat. Which, if you were curious, is the Asian sesame dressing. <laughs> if, if you're curious. Okay. I found the surgery. It's only four minutes long. It's. Let's see. Who would have guessed? Oh, that's going to be really loud. cheek pain and who had a cloudy right maxillary sinus on playing films. And the CT scan is shown here, showed an opacified right maxillary sinus and our working diagnosis was either chronic right maxillary sinusitis or a mucosal in the maxillary Oh, that... Yeah, he, he the CT scan revealed that the walls of the maxillary sinus were normal. Sinus was opacified, filled with material, and the osteomedial complex appeared to be blocked by an enlarged right middle terminate. The bony middle terminate is of normal size, but the mucosa over the bony middle terminate. The patient presents small. with a right-sided opacified maxillary sinus and what appears to be a somewhat enlarged right middle terminate. I'll take the fear elevator. No, it does show blood. I don't think it gets squeezy. I'm just going to first of all displace this metal turbinate in a medial direction. It is quite mobile, which means that when we're finished the procedure, it's likely to go back and lateralize. When that happens, I usually like to just remove the anterior end of the metal turbinate at the conclusion of the procedure. So Suck the snot out. Three cup forceps. I'm just thinking it'll just 
here into the middle turbinate to such an extent that it no longer can close off the middle meatus. That's gentle. Now we can see the uncinate process quite nicely. We'll take it for elevator. Gently transect the upper portion. Slide on down inferiorly. We're not to the cholesterol yet. Slip into the maxillary sinus osteum and calor border. Yeah. Oh, you get to see it in a moment. Trace our steps. Elevating it medially. Take straight cups. Yeah, but if you ever see them do it, they just literally take the guts out and I'll slip them back in. And they, they, they're rough. You're not going to be ginger about this. <laughs> okay, now we're getting to the cyst. That's why it's not a cell. Um, I, I don't know if it's blue or whatever that light colored thing is. Yes, I don't know the color. Cholesterol crystals. See, cholesterol does solidify. That's why they are crystals. You'll be able to see them in a moment. It's a very thin system. It's filled with a clear liquid, which has got little crystals in it with cholesterol. You just see the crystals floating on the surface there. Now you watch the size of the cyst. Get rid of this. The lying of the cyst. Why aren't they sucking out the cholesterol? Oh, you just wait. They they get it out. <laughs> there we go. It's pulling oh. out. <laughs> nice little lining. It's like the magician. <laughs> Like with the magicians pulling out the... There, now he's sucking it out. You should be happy now, Jackie. <laughs> so we did a much better job on this if we'd actually use a shaver. We'll do it next time. <laughs> next time, I'm hoping this guy's thinking there's not, not going to be a next time. But yes, you can get these cysts pretty much anywhere. That's why it's not just a... Sounds like, like a cell in that sense. A normal one would say tumor. But. What's that? Yeah, we're going to go out for. Go to with their big, thick burger and, you know, 3,000 calorie burger with fries and a shake. <laughs> That's lovely. <laughs> now we need Lorraine here. <laughs> She's missing this, so. <laughs> Do you? No, you really need to see. <laughs> okay, so that's my little. I, I'm on the soapbox now to say limit your cholesterol intake. <laughs> so that way you don't have pictures like that coming out. I mean, that is a huge cyst. Like, no wonder he's having cheek pain. I mean, there's only so much room there. I wonder, I wonder if he just thought that, oh, I've got to stop that nose for the last couple of months or whatever. But Okay, so I want you to be able to talk about the logic here. I mean, it should make sense if you have too much cholesterol in your diet. It's going to upregulate or activate ACAT because that's trying to store it just to get it out from being free-floating anywhere and everywhere. But it also does downregulate the expression of the LDL receptors. And so that that cholesterol in the LDL has got to go somewhere if you continue on with that lifestyle. Um, I mean, there, and there are biological and genetic defects, you know, with HMG CoA reductase or something like that to where you could have um, some of these health problems that are not due because of poor diet choices. Okay, and so this is just another way of showing the regulation of cholesterol. The first way was the cartoony way. In this way, you know, where you see the HMG CoA reductase, it gets activated by insulin, which why does that make sense that if insulin will activate HMG CoA to make 
more cholesterol. When do we have insulin? Okay. All right. So, and then after the meal, so why would we want to be making the cholesterol ultimately going to, you know... Right, it's going to be for energy and energy storage here. And so this is one way that we can store it for later on in the form of cholesterol esters. Glucagon is going to turn this down, regulate it, because we're going to be wanting to keep the acetyl-CoA for other reasons rather than having it um, being diverted to make form the forming of, you know, cholesterol. Okay. <coughs> um, then the cholesterol itself as I mentioned before, regulates HMG-CoA reductase. And so that way, if you have too much cholesterol, it's going to turn this down, downregulate this, and it's going to activate the ACAT. Okay? And it's going to also decrease the amount of receptor-mediated endocytosis, which is the expression of the receptors on the outside of the cell itself. Okay. So, so the statin drugs actually inhibit HMG, or many of them inhibit HMG-CoA reductase. That's the one that I was wanting you to, to remember, okay? And the fact is that they look an awful lot like mevalonate. So one end of them essentially mirrors mevalonate. I mean, it's missing a methyl group. And then it has, so for those who are in medicinal chemistry, we talk about the, the lead or, you know, the, the backbone of the compound. And then what you do is you just change whatever functional groups are hanging off. And so Zocor has a methyl group, and well, two methyl groups, where the R groups are, whereas compactin, or those are just hydrogens, and there's mevacor and propocol and things like that. So you can see that the statin drugs help. Do they actually help with your diet cholesterol, dietary cholesterol, or are they really focused on your endogenous cholesterol? Endogenous. That's why I personally get really ticked off when I see some of these people that will say, oh, you know, I've got bad cholesterol. I take, you know, a statin drug, and yet they don't modify their diet. It's not going to help, okay? It's going to just be worse. You still have to have smart dietary choices along with your statin drug in order to, to try to, to fight this battle. But one of the major consequences of having too much LDL, of course, is atherosclerosis. That's the one that most people think about. You don't think about getting cysts, you know, in your sinus cavity or, you know, any other place in your body necessarily. Usually you think about the plaque formation with atherosclerosis. And it actually kills more people in the U.S. per year than cancer. Okay, so it is definitely a major point to think about. This is just another picture just to show, I mean, it's just a little bit more precise, I guess, or indicative, or representative is probably a better word, of what happens versus that other cartoon. Okay, apolipoproteins also have other functions. There's lots of different, different possibilities. There's not, ApoB is not the only one, not only that, but there's multiple Bs. I don't expect you to memorize these. I just want you to know that apolipoproteins, that there's a whole host of them, and they are associated with different types of the vesicles, and that they have different um, functions, if they're known. Some of them aren't known. And that's actually the end. Are there, are there any questions over the fate of cholesterol? Yeah. The good, the bad, and the runny. Yeah, because I always like to show that video with the runny. That's kind of a runny nose. It's just an extreme. <laughs> what were they cutting out beforehand? Just like parts of the stuff? Yeah, I mean, I'm not a... What, what is it? Part of it, like this the septum part, and they, he had, I think it looked like an extra growth, because in that video they talk about how it is blocking, and they didn't want to grow back, and so that's why he literally transected it and removed part of it to where it can't touch, or it won't be as easy for it to grow back, but yeah, you get skin folds and flaps and things like that that grow inside, just like you do on the outside of your skin. So did he just, like, think that he had a deep Who's the, the patient? Yeah. I, mean, I don't know. You know exactly the same thing I do. He said that he presented cheek pain. <laughs> like, well, I don't know. It's like, oh. Like right. Cool right, because they did the, they did the, mm -hmm. they, you know, they took the, the picture of it, and so they could see that it, there was something solid there, not just the light tissue. The normal sinuses. I would think so. I mean, yeah, it would have to be on that one side. I would think they'd just feel like you have a, you can only breathe through one side of your nose. 
that was just nasty. So, yep, any other questions or comments? Other than the fact that if you haven't eaten, you may not want to for a little bit. Or it's time for a salad. <laughs> Yeah. I don't know how I came across that one years ago. I, I've shown that one for years and years, and it's been, if you look at the number of times it's been played, it's been played a lot. But, um, yeah, it, it was a really, really good and interesting one. Because I had never even thought about, oh, I mean, I've heard about different cysts, you know, because people get, like, when you get calcium deposits in different thing, places as well. And so this is sort of like that, except instead of calcium, it's cholesterols. So it's got to go somewhere. And it went up in his science cavity. Yeah, that's so weird. You're not going to sell anything. I mean, it's just nasty. What about all the ones that got crystallized? What? Right, I mean, well, I mean, I'm assuming one hit where he's he's out, but it would go down. Just like snot runs down your throat all the time. Yeah, I mean, for, you mean from that, that leak during the surgery? Yeah. Or yeah. when it calcifies, right? Right. Um, that one, well, I mean, that one was inside the cyst for that patient, and so it wasn't, I mean, he wasn't excreting it. That was his problem. Now, I don't know if his is also a genetic, because he didn't look to be really obese. There is one other, there, there's multiple copies of that video, and because there's another one that I've seen, I think it's the same patient where they take it out, you know, it's really stringy, and then they just like lay it on the little surgery table there, and yeah, it's nasty. It's nasty. It kind of reminds me of afterbirth. <laughs> yeah, it's, yeah. It's mm-hmm. Makes you really want to go out and eat a bunch of eggs. No, I'm just joking. I remember. Uh... <laughs> Dr. Straw was like, it's like a pancake. I was like, ah, 